All right. Well, welcome to uh, my channel. It's Larson Hicks here again, and I'm excited to have my first guest on my my uh, video podcast here um, on YouTube. And uh, and this has been this has been something I've been really looking forward to. Um, it's Pastor Rich Lusk, who is based down in Birmingham. Um, Pastor Lusk and I go way back. Uh, he was actually my sister and brother's uh, pastor, I guess assistant pastor, back in Austin, way, way back in the day. Um, so I've been hearing about him since, uh, since I was in college. Uh, He's making a big impact on my siblings. And then... Um, and then uh, he was came up through the PCA and ended up in uh, in the CRC in Birmingham, Alabama, where he pastors Trinity Presbyterian Church, who also happened to be the sponsor church for uh, the church that that I serve as an elder at here in Huntsville, Alabama. So um, have lots and lots of reasons to be thankful for this man here. Um, so thanks, thanks, uh, including today. So thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Great to be with you. I like how you uh, abbreviated a lot in there to <laughs> jumped over a lot of things that it's just yeah. as well to jump over, I guess. Well, I, I so the when I tell people about because I, I talk about Pastor Lusk a lot and uh, and the way that I describe Pastor Lusk's teachings and sermons is um, that scene in The Matrix where neo is getting plugged in and he's learning martial arts you know and he you see him like they shove the 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 needle thing in the back of his head and he kind of squints his eyes and then he opens them and he goes i know jujitsu um that's how i feel every time i listen to a rich lust sermon so if you're like if you've got the stomach for that kind of intense experience of just being plugged in and having and downloading massive amounts of information um then you you need to get on Trinity Prez Birmingham's website and check out uh, Rich Less Sermons because that's that's your style, which is which is really cool. Everyone's got their own style, and I feel like yours is like just a carpet bomb of of content of awesome research and information. So I, it's it's always a thrilling uh, experience hearing you preach and teach. Appreciate that. Yeah, you know, as a, as a pastor, you know, your job, in a way, you could say, is to help your congregation master this book, the Bible. Yeah. And there's a lot in here. There's a lot to master. There's a lot to Absolutely. know. Uh, you know, you want to master the Bible and be mastered by it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the aim of preaching and teaching is to impart that truth to God's people in practical ways. Yeah. Praise God. Well, you are, uh, you're a blessing to our church, uh, to our family, and... Um, and I'm excited to introduce uh, my small audience here on on YouTube to to you. If if any of them aren't familiar with you, they may all be already. But um, but I love this topic um, today, and and uh, I hope that this is not a this is also I hope not the beginning of of lots of of these kinds of conversations. Um, but today's topic is wisdom. You preached uh, a series of sermons. Um, early 2021 on the topic of wisdom uh, specifically uh, there was a sermon i think it was february what was it 14th was it valentine's day i think, yeah, I think that's right yeah that sounds yeah. right and then and then another in march um and uh and they were two it was it was really cool because it was um it was really kind of the two sides of the coin of wisdom uh wisdom as it's presented to us in proverbs and wisdom as it's presented to us in ecclesiastes um and uh and there's so much depth um to plumb here um but i'm i'm just excited to have the opportunity to kind of scratch the surface with you today and maybe where where we should start there's a there's a million different places to start um but um why don't we start with could you describe and explain to me what the therapeutic turn is and 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 what that's all about yeah, so the, I think the therapeutic turn is best understood as a turn that's taken place, uh, really started to take place sometime in the last century. Uh, and I think really now is coming to a, um, I don't want to say a culmination, but uh, I think you could associate it with the rise of postmodernity. Right. And the therapeutic turn is really this focus on feelings. 
where fe- you know feelings obviously god designed us to be emotional creatures that's sure. true of men and women both even though men and women um you could say emote differently there there are certainly differences sure. there but men and women are both emotional creatures god made us that way uh our emotions in a way are a reflection of 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 god who is described in the scripture as having uh various emotions but uh the therapeutic turn uh, is really where emotions and feelings, and you might even say experiences, become the authority. And if I feel something, it must be right, it must be true, every feeling must be validated, I will follow my feelings. The therapeutic turn is really the gospel according to Disney, follow your heart. Uh, and, and the therapeutic turn uh, says every feeling has to be validated. You can't help how you feel. And, and to give you one example of this, a really extreme form, but it's where we've ended up, uh, think about the, the transgender uh, movement and, and the, uh, the, the rise of transgender ideology. And I, obviously there are people who experience gender dysphoria and they need help and they need sure. compassion and, and all that's true. Uh, but think about what a person says when they make the claim, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, or I feel like a, yeah, I feel like a man trapped in a woman's body, or the reverse. Uh, feelings there are being treated as an authority, the way you feel. Right. And feelings are allowed to even trump the objective facts of biology. So uh, another way to describe the therapeutic term would be to say it puts feelings over facts. Right. Um, you know, there, there's the saying that a lot of conservatives use facts, don't care about your feelings. And right. I think that's true, although that, that needs to be qualified and worked out too, uh, because it's, again, it's not as if feelings are totally irrelevant to life. They're sure. important, but, uh, the therapeutic turn means replacing facts with feelings, mm-hmm. uh, feelings become the most important thing. And I think that's largely where we are as a culture. Uh, yeah. you can, and you can trace out this in all kinds of ways, in the ways that stories are told. Uh, advertising is a really good example of this. It used to be that advertising aimed at communicating information about the product. Now right. advertising is mostly about creating a certain feeling or inviting you into a certain experience. Right. And that that's really become the norm. That's become the standard by which people operate. Have you tried to figure out when the therapeutic turn really came about or what the fountainhead? And, and as you described advertising, a, a little light went off in my head that maybe that's maybe that's where because I think about, you know, advertising coming into its own in the 50s or so seems to be when when advertising was really, really taking this uh, coming into its own as a field that was it was more than just telling you the features of a product, you know, um, and and you, you think of like the Sears Roebuck catalog that was just, you know, a catalog with pretty pictures, but it was it was still just about here's what the here's what the thing is and here's the price um, where uh, it seems like in the 50s or so around that time, advertising became all about uh, about giving you an image of a beautiful woman or, or a handsome man doing something, you know, and, and it, it was less about the product and more about how the product would make you into something else. Or, um, so it seems like it started, I, I just wonder if, if there's a connection there or, or, or where, where you think the kind of fountainhead for this therapeutic turn is. Yeah, it's a great question. And I don't know that you can pinpoint it. If you, if you want the, uh, the fullest account of a genealogy, the, 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 the sort of backstory for this that, that I have come across is probably Carl Truman's book, uh, yeah. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, because yeah. what, what, what is sometimes called expressive individualism is you could say that's also the, the therapeutic turn. Uh, and he gives a lot of background in that book, going back to into, into the romantic poets and the transcendentalists and, and all these other historical sources. And I, I yeah. think that's a good way to look at it. But I would say as far as being a widespread cultural phenomenon, uh, I think the 1960s. I mean, you said the 1950s is kind of when, you know, marketing really starts to take off. I think the 1960s with the sexual revolution, yeah. uh, casting off uh the discipline and restraints that had been there in society on our sexuality uh because that that's obviously closely related to this uh and and ultimately it is a rejection of god's word uh again if god's word is our authority then god's word is going to tell us how we should feel about certain things god's you know we're, we're going to want to shape our emotions and our feelings with god's truth 
Uh, I think that's the kind of thing you see the psalmist doing in Psalms 42 and 43, where he's despondent, he's downcast, and then he asks himself, why, you know, oh my soul, why are you downcast within me? And he starts to speak truth to himself. So instead of just right. letting the feeling take over, he speaks right. truth back to the feeling. He's talking to himself, but he's, right. he's preaching truth to himself. And, right. and so he's pushing back against feelings that he, know, that he knows are not right. So, right. yeah, well, I mean, again, the, the point is not a kind of stoicism, but the point would be for our emotions to be synced right. uh, with God's word, that, that our feelings would be aligned with reality as God defines it. And right. the therapeutic turn is basically turn feelings into a kind of idol. Feelings become a standalone authority. Another great example of this is, is with empathy and some of the debates that have taken yeah. place over the last several years over empathy and whether or not empathy is a virtue or a vice. Right. And, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, you do have passages like Romans 12, where uh, Paul says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, that that's empathy in a nutshell. Right. We're supposed yeah. to. Uh, you know, if, if, if your uh, brother in Christ has something good happen to him, he gets a raise or is getting to go on a vacation, don't don't covet that. Don't be jealous of that. Yeah. Rejoice in that. Rejoice with him. If he loses a loved one, share with him in his sorrow. That's part of what it means to share a common life in the body of Christ. So th there's, there's a good side to empathy. But when empathy is cut loose from a moral framework, uh, then it can actually become very, very evil. And I think this is what you're seeing in our culture is there's a kind of empathy that, that goes in all the wrong directions. Uh, so when empathy no longer has the moral compass of God's word to guide it, what happens? Right. Well, then, then your, your, your only concern is with not offending people or with not hurting people's feelings. Right. And so then right. you can no longer say things that are true. Right. Now you have to... Uh, you have to shave down the truth or you have to simply join in with the lies that the culture is telling or that people are telling right. themselves so that you do not cause offense. And I think this is why a lot of um, once faithful evangelical people or churches or institutions have caved on the LGBTQ issue mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of empathy. They, they don't want to offend. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, I think it's sometimes why parents can't discipline children, because in order to yeah. raise children well, sometimes you have to inflict pain. Uh, and, and parents who don't have the, again, the moral compass of God's word and the courage uh, and, 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 and the trust in God to inflict that pain on their child temporarily right. for the sake of, of teaching their child obedience, teaching their child to fear God, teaching their child discipline, uh, you, you're going to get bad results from that. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, I think you can see a lot of error, and I think this is again, this is this is another way of getting at what the therapeutic turn is all about. You could say it's sort of the triumph of, of empathy over everything else, and empathy mm -hmm. cut loose uh, from any kind of moral framework. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's funny. I, I was looking at a, a conversation that that a friend of mine was having on on uh, Facebook about empathy recently, and uh, he's training to be a physician, and he was just saying, in medical school empathy is like it's king and it's talked about constantly empathizing with your patients and he's like he, he was struggling with it and saying you know well my job is to stand outside of the patient as somebody who's well and as somebody who can understand and discern what's wrong with them and I certainly want to I want to understand uh, how they're feeling and be able to be sy sympathetic but uh, to, to how they're feeling and, and not a jerk right but but uh Ultimately, my goal is to bring them up out of their situation um, and not just right. get in there with them and say it's okay, you know, and, and yeah. I, I'll feel bad with you. Yeah, that, that's a great, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great example because what, what we want, we do want doctors who are empathetic. You know, we talk right. about doctors having a good bedside manner or what have you. Right. Obviously, you want a doctor who's going to treat you as a, as a fellow human being uh, right. who, who's not going to deliver the bad news about the medical report. Right. Uh, right. you know, in a, in a calloused way. But what we want most from our doctors is the truth. Okay. Right. Uh, a doctor is going to say, you know what, you're overweight. You'll be much healthier if you lose weight. I may hurt your feelings. People in the culture may say that's fat, fat shaming, you know, that kind of thing. We're not allowed to do that anymore again because right. of empathy, but you want a doctor to tell you the truth or uh, think about a doctor who won't deliver the bad news about, um, cancer, you know, and, and, and the best forms of treatment available or what have you. Uh, we want doctors who are going to speak truth to us, even though it's going to be painful to hear. And in a way, preachers are in the same position 
we have to say things to yeah. people that are painful. We have to say yeah. things to people that are going to hurt. And if you don't have the courage to do, you know, I've always said, if you want everybody to like you, um, you know, drive an ice cream truck, you know, yeah. because I, everybody right. likes that guy. Yeah, uh, right. but, but otherwise, you're going to have to be able to endure uh, people not liking you. And there's a lot in scripture about the fear of man, becoming a man pleaser, um, living for the praise of other people. I think that, that, and that's a real issue. And again, that all ties in with this. Uh, the therapeutic term means not only do we bow down before other people's feelings, but we down, bow down before our own. And, you know, if I, if I want to be liked, if that becomes my main thing, my main goal right. in life is, is to be liked, well, then I, I'm going to be useless. Uh, because right. I can't speak truth to people. And I think there's a lot of that going on in the church. I think you see a lot of pastors today. They do not have the courage. Uh, they, they think s civility and, mm -hmm. and, and tone are more important than content, uh, right. more important than speaking courageously the truth that people right. need to hear. And I think that's a big part of what's gotten us into the mess that we're in. Yeah, you talked about parenting and, and not to like try to boil this or try to boil this down to a masculinity femininity thing because there's it's a lot more complex there's a lot more going on with empathy and 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 its role in our current society um but but i, I do think about the dynamic between dad and mom uh with with little kids and especially with little boys you know your 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 wife is seems mostly concerned with nurturing them making sure they're they're healthy and they feel well um and uh and they're and they're growing you know well um and and i and i think your wife also this is just how god's built women there there is this i think heightened um uh sense of empathy you know where your kid falls and scrapes their knee and and you can see it on a mom's face like they it hurts them to see their child you know hurting you know um and and the thing about men is as fathers god's wired us in a way to where especially with our young men we are oriented towards making sure our kids are going to survive later you know we're we're looking at um we're, we're looking ahead to the day when that boy is going to be on his own and he's going to be out in the world is he going to be the kind of kid you know the kind of adult who who can't handle being reprimanded by a boss or or has a bad day at work and falls apart and and or you know whatever the situation is um gets fired and 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 you know and and, and can't pull himself together and and lead and and uh and so we're looking at that little boy who's crying over a scraped knee and we're wanting to get him to stand up dust it off don't cry you know uh, because we're concerned as men with with their survival out in the world um is and so anyway i i don't know if that's that's a that's a rabbit trail to go down but but it's, no, you're, um, you're, you're you're exactly right and I'll, I'll jump in and add this to your description i i think that's right the differences between moms and dads and yeah. and obviously that's why god has designed a, a child to yeah. have both a mom and a dad i mean that yeah. that's the, that's the ideal that's the norm uh, and, and that's for a reason, because a child, because mothers and fathers live in the same way. In fact, I, I've gotten to where I would say uh, we shouldn't even talk about parenting anymore. Yes. We should talk specifically about mothering and fathering because they're yes. so different. Mothers yes. and fathers love their kids in different ways, complementary ways. And the child needs masculine love poured into his life and he needs yeah. feminine love poured into his life. He needs the love of a father poured into him. He needs that maternal, he needs that love of a mother poured into him as well. And, and so another way of getting at this, you know, you started off asking about the therapeutic turn. Another way of yeah. getting at this would be to say that the rise of the therapeutic turn, uh, this um, privileging feelings above, right. above, above truth, above God's word, uh, all these other things we're talking about, the, the, the rise of, of empathy, sort of swallowing everything else up. You could say that, it's, that, that it goes hand in hand with the rise of feminism and the feminization right. of our culture. Right. Uh, that's one reason why I think our culture is so filled with anxiety and why our culture right. is so soft. It's because we have lost any kind of masculine presence and masculine grounding uh, in the culture. Um, right. So what happens when you've got you know a whole generation where half the half the kids or more are raised in a fatherless home, yep. and they're they're put in uh, school environments that are mostly dominated by women, 
and and they, they don't have very much of a masculine presence in their life. I think you can see the kind of things we're seeing in our society today. It's yeah. very unhealthy. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there's a lot more to go into there. And uh, but but for the sake of uh, of staying on topic, because I because I, I do want to get I want to get deeper into um, into wisdom. Um, we'll, we'll, I think that's, that serves as a good introduction to this, this con, you know, kind of where we are today, um, with the therapeutic turn, I think it's clear, uh, that this is, th- this is the world we're living in right now, uh, a world dominated by feelings, um, feelings have become the ultimate standard. You know, the only thing that really matters is that you feel good about yourself and about your situation. Um, and so, and so the contrast with that is, is wisdom. Uh, it seems the contrast is, is, uh, is what is being done in, in the Proverbs. Um, and so, so from a, from the standpoint of the Proverbs, what is wisdom? How, how, how do you define wisdom? Yeah, that, that's great. So I, you know, you made reference to a couple sermons that, uh, that I preached last year on, on wisdom and, and you know, summarizing wisdom from Proverbs, summarizing wisdom from Ecclesiastes. I think if you're looking at wisdom in the book of Proverbs, I think really you could trace it back to Exodus, I believe it's chapter 28 with Bezalel. Uh, mm-hmm. He's the first person in the Bible who is described as possessing wisdom. And what does Bezalel do? He takes stone he takes he takes these precious metals of gold and silver. I don't remember all the materials that are listed. Wood, yeah. uh, and he uses his wisdom hmm. as a craftsman to reshape and and mold those raw materials uh, into objects of glory and beauty for the worship of God. And so, wisdom there is tied to several things. It's tied to worship, and it's it, it's tied. You could say it's tied to work. And it's tied to worship. It, it's it's manifested in the way that he uh, works with the creation, mastering the creation, subduing the creation, ruling over the creation. That's really what he's doing. He's ruling over these materials. He's subduing these materials. Uh, he's transforming these materials. And that's what the original creation mandate is all about. So this right. is a form of work. And of course, it's ultimately for the sake of worship. It, he's making right. objects of glory and beauty that will be used in the tabernacle. So I would say this is really what wisdom is. Wisdom is doing with your life what Bezalel did with those materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, In order for Bezalel to shape those materials, he had to understand the natures and properties of those materials. He had to work, you could say, with the grain of the creation. Uh, He's got to understand the temperatures at which the metals melt or the kind of... um, Mm -hmm. what kind of chisel to use on the stone or... Uh, what kind of uh, saw needs to be used with the wood? Th- those kinds of things. He's got to he's got to master the properties of the world around him, in order right. to rule over them, in order to take dominion over them. And in a way, I think that's what wisdom is. It's, it's doing that with your life. It's it's shaping your life. It's molding your life. It's chiseling out a life uh, full of glory and beauty uh, mm-hmm. that aims at worshiping God. And that means doing that in your relationships, doing it in your work, doing it in your uh, in your marriage, in your parenting, uh, in, in all these different ways. And I think what, what the book of Proverbs does, Proverbs really is, a, a it's not a reflection on the natures and properties of wood and stone and, and right. gold and silver, but it is a reflection on the natures and properties of, of humans, of men and women and right. children and wider communities and, and, and human life in general. It, it, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really based largely on observations about the way the world works. And right. so right. wisdom in the book of Proverbs, I think, is all about how to fulfill that original creation mandate in a fallen world. You go back to Genesis chapter one, the mandate for the human race is to rule over the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over it, and to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth. So it's, the, it's those, those verbs that, that really describes and defines what God's purpose is for the human race. The book of Proverbs picks up on that mandate from Genesis 1, yeah. and yeah. it's a father teaching his son. It's the king t- teaching the prince. This is how you fulfill that mandate in a fallen world. And so Proverbs really is about wisdom for your work and your wife. 
it's wisdom right. for your mission and your marriage. And that that's right. primarily what it deals with. Yeah, that's that that's so profound. I I had never heard anybody boil proverbs down that way to being about work and wife and and tying that back to that's what God did in the garden. He said he, he basically is about a task uh, of dominion and um, and and then God gave gave uh, and multiplication. You know, and gave gave Adam a wife uh, to accomplish the task of multiplication. So again, it's work and wife. Um, so 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 Proverbs is picking back up on the creation mandate, and now we're in a we're post fall, um, and so we have this sin issue uh, in the world that we have to deal with. The tying this all back to to Bezalel, I think, is so interesting and unique. That's a take I haven't heard either, um, and I think when we think about Bezalel, we think of a craftsman, a tradesman. Um, it's it's stunning to to hear it said that 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 Bezalel is the first person we're heard who's described as being filled with the Spirit in in Scripture, um, because that doesn't jive at all with my modern understanding of what being filled filled with the Spirit is supposed to be supposed to look like, um, and specifically the Spirit of wisdom. Um, I'm reminded of this book that that Wiley's just Sierra Wiley's just come out with called, about Tom Bombadil and this idea that uh, th this this contrast of dominion versus domination, you know, this this contrast of as you described it, going with the grain versus um, versus forcing things. Um, into conformity with your desires or your feelings. Um, so I think there's, there's that, that idea that Bezalel is a, um, is actually a picture, a really wonderful picture of wisdom is not something that, that, uh, that, that I, I think Christians think about. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And, and, and Bombadil, whoever he is, he does seem to be a picture of, wisdom in middle earth and uh really is the embodiment of dominion it seems like it, it, if you look, look at the way he is he is described there so that that's an interesting that's an interesting thought and interesting connection yeah if you go back to genesis you know genesis 1 you've got this mandate that's given to the man and the woman uh obviously given to, to all of humanity bearing god's image uh, they have this this twofold task. I, I, I even though there's multiple verbs there, I break it down kind of in you know the two sides are basically dominion and multiplication. Right. Uh, so I think that's that's clear in Genesis one. Then in Genesis two, you have kind of the zoomed in account of creation, and so the man is made first, and he is given uh, a specific task. He's given this job of right. guarding and cultivating the garden. And of course, he realizes along the way that he needs help. He certainly can't do the the the, the multiplying and filling part without uh, without a helper in the form of a right. woman. But he can't do the dominion part uh, the way that he should either. Uh, and so God gives him a, a woman, a wife, to be his helper, and then together they'll fulfill this mandate. But I think you you then see in Genesis chapter three that there is something of a, of a uh, if we couldn't already pick up on this, there is something of a division of labor. Uh, within the human race in terms of how this mandate will be fulfilled. Because when the curses come upon the man and the woman, the man and, the curses are not androgynous. They're sex specific. The man is cursed specifically in the realm of dominion. Uh, right. He'll still eat bread, but he's only, right. he's going to have to wrestle with thorns and thistles. It's going to be by the sweat of his brow. It's going to be much harder to get that bread now to, pro to provide, to make provision for right. himself and, and his his family and the woman is cursed in the area of we could say multiplication uh, he, he's cursed in the area of production she's cursed in the area of reproduction mm -hmm. uh is how it looks to me and i think that tells you something respectively about men and women and now what we're wrestling with as we live in a fallen world to fulfill that mandate and obviously the curse cuts across everything we do uh, all the time. We're always wrestling with the effects of, of sin in, in this fallen world. But I think that's an important element to it as well. Proverbs is addressed to the young man. It's obviously right. women can glean wisdom from it as well, but it's addressed to the young man. Uh, but this is another interesting aspect of the book of Proverbs is that Proverbs really is a, uh, it's a courtship story. 
And this is something I think is overlooked because you kind of have to look at the larger structure of the book to see it and not get lost in, in the details. Right. But, uh, you know, when the book opens up, uh, the, the father's giving wisdom to his son and then wisdom herself starts to speak to she the young man yeah. and, and cries yeah. out to the man, you know, here I am, come and get me, basically. Uh, and, and so he is to pursue her. But then along the way, we meet another woman. So you've got Lady Wisdom, but then the son encounters another woman who you could call the Harlot of Folly. And she's dressed up right. in the latest really seductive fashions. And, you know, she's really cute. And she's batting her eyelashes at him. And she's trying to seduce him. And, and, and the whole question is, which of these two women will he pursue? So, you know, along the way, there's a lot in Proverbs, of course, about work and, and a lot of things relate to that. The father's passing along wisdom about work, but he's also passing along wisdom about wife, about who he should marry. And that's the question that confronts him. That's the main question that's got to be answered by the end of the book is which one of these two women will the young man pursue and marry and build a household with? And what you find when you get to the end of the book, Proverbs 31, how does it end? It ends with this um, glorious description of this idealized woman who he has made his his his, his queen. Uh, and, and and you get the sense, okay, the two of them are going to live happily ever after. They're going to build this this great you know yeah. kingdom together, this empire together. Uh, that that's the picture you have. So it's interesting to me, uh, Frederick Nietzsche said truth is a woman and he meant that as an insult both to truth and to women uh, because he hated truth and he was a misogynist who hated women in proverbs you have the exact opposite wisdom is a woman and that is a compliment to the woman and of course also to wisdom and and uh, if the man finds the right kind of woman then yes she will be a great compliment to him and he will learn a great deal of wisdom from her, just as she will learn a great deal of wisdom from him. I mean, again, you see the the, the complementary nature of, of manhood and womanhood there. So uh, I think that that's another aspect of Proverbs that sometimes gets overlooked. It really is telling a story. It's a kind of love story. Yeah. Uh, but the man can't just be guided by his feelings. Right. Uh, in order to, to choose the right woman, he's got to be guided by wisdom. In order to choose lady wisdom, he has to be wise himself. Man, that's I mean that that's profound too. I don't I don't think most of us um, have ever zoomed out and looked at proverbs as a story and thought about it along those lines. But the pattern's clearly there, and and um, and you also in your sermon drew the connection to to the creation mandate ultimately belonging to Christ and His bride, the Church, um, that's right. which which also is is profound. Um, but this idea that that Proverbs is about a prince being instructed by his father in how to become a king and and then how to marry, you know, to make wisdom his his queen, um, is is uh, adds just just adds a whole whole other dimension to to reading the Proverbs. Um, so so what it looks like to me then is that wisdom in the Proverbs is uh, you described it as a reality check it's 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 going it's us undergoing the process that bezalel who's filled with the spirit was able to go through where he was able to discern the nature of these materials that he's working with in order to master them and and turn them to their highest best purpose which which is the glorification of god and worship so, so how is Proverbs doing that? Um, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I think that's another way to think about wisdom. Wisdom is being in touch with reality. Right. And sometimes you have non-Christians who are, who are in touch, at least with certain aspects of reality. I mean, you know, I, sure. I know we both appreciate somebody like Jordan Peterson, who seems to be in yeah. touch with, with wide swaths of reality, even though he, yeah. he still can't put it all together. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, and I might have even quoted him in the sermon, I don't recall, but you know, Chesterton says the point of having an open mind is like having an open mouth. It's in order to close it on something solid. Right. So what is that solid thing? Chesterton in another place, and again, this is about 100 years ago, but he said the first effect when people stop believing in God is they come to believe anything at all. It's, it's not that they just stop believing altogether. It's that having given up on belief in God, they're now completely gullible and fall for all kinds right. of other lies. So he says the first effect of not believing in God is the loss of common sense. 
I think what you're seeing in our culture, because we have rejected God, we have rejected God's wisdom, which means we have rejected reality. Christ, creation, and common sense all stand or fall together. You reject Christ, you're going to reject the creation the way God made the world, you're going to reject common sense, you're going to be left with nothing at all. It's, it's ultimately either Christ or chaos. You can't get rid of Christ and then hang on to common sense. You can't get rid of Christ and still have reality in any kind of ultimate right. way. So I, th so th so I think what we're seeing in our culture, you know, you have to ask the question because we have seen massive changes take place in our culture, not just in the last you know couple years, especially I think uh, everything with COVID definitely sort of opened Pandora's box to a lot of changes. I think things got really accelerated. Uh, but even going back before that, things were changing our culture very, very rapidly where we're now clearly rejecting God uh, on a broad scale, rejecting God's truth that means we're rejecting reality. And again, I mean, I've used transgenderism as, as an example already. This is a pretty good example of it, I think, where you reject God. Next thing, you, you don't even know which bathroom people should be using. You know, how did we get from, you know, could we reject God and still hang on to at least male and female? Well, the answer really is no. You reject God. You really are rejecting reality. Proverbs, I think, describes wisdom as a kind of reality check. Uh, Proverbs means getting in touch with the way things actually are. You used an illustration from The Matrix earlier. I thought you were going to do something a little bit different with that. But The Matrix is, is the movie that sort of injected into the mainstream of popular culture, this red pill, blue pill um, right. way of looking right. at things. Where the, and I know there's different ways of taking it, but the, the red pill is you face hard truths. The truth is hard to swallow, but you'd rather know the truth even if it hurts, okay? Whereas the blue pill is basically living in a kind of fantasy world. And again, that's the choice that the young man is faced with. The fear of God is the ultimate red pill. Because if you fear God, that's going to put you in touch with the way things are. And that means, for example, you're going to see that you cannot prosper without working, okay? Now, blue pill foolishness, you know, this is what the young man wishes were true, He's going to, he, he wishes that he could sleep in. Uh, he wishes that he could do his own thing all day, you know, basically be lazy and still somehow, uh, you know, have, have food to eat and drink at the end of the day. And Proverbs says, no, if, if you are lazy, poverty is going to come upon you like a prowler. You're lazy, so you're not, you're not going to see it coming. You're going to be ambushed by poverty, but it's going to come upon you. Uh, I think what you're seeing in our culture is this rejection of God that leads to a rejection of reality. And so we are basically now living in the matrix in this blue pill world totally. where, you know, we think that you can uh, basically shut down the economy and pay people not to work and yet still somehow, you know, end up with an uninterrupted uninter supply chain. Now, if you pay people to not work, people are not going to work, and that means jobs are not going to get done, and that means you're going to have massive shortages of things. That's that's just reality. Uh, we live in this in this in this blue pill world where people think that um, you know you you can you can ignore the way the world actually works, and yet still somehow make things work in the end, and it just can't happen. It's it's just again that's just not reality. So I, I think. I think what Proverbs is showing us is that while reality and truth, you know, this may be a hard pill to swallow. Uh, if, if the young man wants to live a prosperous and happy life in the long run, he's got to swallow that. He's got to swallow God's truth. He's got to swallow reality as God made it and then work with it and work within those parameters. I, I think the, uh, I love everything you said. And there's like 25 different things I want to say in response to everything you said, but but I'll, I'll focus on one because I think it's really important, and that's that that Proverbs is addressed to a king's son, and and the end that's in view is dominion and 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 kingship, and I think that that one of the things that you and I both know and everybody knows is that if you go back to a time where you don't have the kind of prosperity that we that we still have in America and in, in the West generally if you just dump somebody in the wilderness you know give you know their fan just you know, drive a family out into in a truck and just dump them in the wilderness all of these properties of reality you know are going to become abundantly clear to them and all of this stuff is just going to fall into place in a lot of ways right 
it's just going to have to or they're going to die. Like survival is based on it. And I think there's this whole movement right now in Christian in Christendom towards that, towards let's unplug, let's unplug from the matrix, let's go back to a simpler time, a simpler uh, reality. Let's let's basically go back to the stone age so we can all live um, with you know, in, 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 with reality, um, and, 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 and sort of become reacquainted with reality. Um, I, I think that's a, I think it's a wrong reaction. I, I think that's a, that's a, that's running away from kingship. That's running away from dominion. That's running away from maturity. And I think the idea in, in scripture is that, and you talk about this in the second sermon is is uh the goal is maturity you know we are we are going to uh we're told in scripture that we are going to judge the angels um so so how do i get from where i am today um to a place to where i'm going to be able to judge angels well it's going to take a lot of growing up well yeah so i i have said uh you're you're right about that and i don't think that that running and hiding is a good reaction because they will hunt you down and find you (laughs) i mean you may not have interest in fighting the culture war anymore but the culture war still is interested in you and uh and 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 so whether you want it or not they're going to bring the fight to you and that's you know that's uh I, i think there's there there you know here you could kind of fill this in with a whole discussion of the Benedict option from Rod Dreher or other right, approaches right. to culture that Christians are taking. But let's 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 sidestep all of that, and I'll just focus on what what you said. Yeah, how, how do you get that kind of maturity? I, I tell people this is how you can think about your life. Okay, you are um, you are the mayor of a small town, mm-hmm. and you rule over that small town, and you're responsible for how things go in that small town. And then if you're faithful, God will promote you and make you the governor of a state and right. your, 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 your dominion, your territory, your, the range, uh, the, 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 the domain over which you rule will be expanded. And then ultimately you might become the president of a country or, or beyond. Uh, but, but there's this progressive maturation in life where God's giving you more and more dominion. God's giving you a, a, a larger and larger realm to rule over. So, you know, think about this when you're, you know, when you're a little kid growing up, it may be the only real domain you have is your bedroom and your, your mom and dad say to you, you know, clean your room, make your bed, keep it tidy. Okay. That's your space. You're responsible to rule over that space. Well, okay. Well then you, uh, you grow up, you leave the house, you go get an apartment and now you've got, you know, a little bit more square footage you're ruling over and you're responsible, not just for a bedroom, but for a kitchen and a, Right. And, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a living space, a family room. And now that's your domain. And not only that, but, you know, maybe when you were a little kid, it was just cutting the grass and doing some chores around the house. Now you've got a job with much greater responsibilities. OK. And then you get married and you start having kids and you move into a house and now you've got a wife to take care of. And and uh, and, and you've got a, a house that's bigger than your apartment and you've got a job now with even greater responsibilities. And then God gives you a kid and now you've got one kid that's 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 you know we'd say now maybe you're ruling over a state you know with a population of three but you know there you have it and then you had a few more kids and next thing you know you're you know the population of the state you're ruling is up to five or six but but that's how you got to think about it you know your your dominion your domain is being expanded and the question is are you ruling over that territory well uh can you give a good account for how you have stewarded all that God has put into your hand, all that God has entrusted you with, right. or not, uh, and that's really the question. And yeah, I think if we're uh, if, if we're going to be faithful to that mandate, we have to uh, not be afraid of what's happening in the world. Uh, I think we need to be willing to confront it. Uh, I, I I understand when people want to get to places where there's a wider community, Christian community, to be a part of, and that sure, kind of, thing. of course, yeah. But I think the idea that we sort of run and hide from the world, I think, is is trying to escape our responsibilities instead of mm-hmm. embrace them. And it's a, it's going to be a failure uh, to fulfill that dominion mandate in the ways that we should. So uh, right. we've got to we've got to learn to live in the world without falling into yeah. worldliness, to be in the world, but not of right. it is the cliche we use to describe that. But it's a cliche because it's true. It's, it's what we're called to do. So, yes, we need our we need us. We need strong and healthy Christian families and Christian churches that we're a part of. Uh, at the same time, I would say uh, we, we have to, um, 
we have to be in the world where we can actually make a difference, where we can um, embody and proclaim Christ's lordship to people who have rejected him. And I think a lot of Christians, they don't want the collision. And so and, and they will talk about, say, well, let's engage the culture. Okay, well, that, that's fine. But what's it mean to engage? I mean, you engage an enemy on the battlefield, you know, uh, so, so what's that engagement look like? Uh, I think a lot of Christians are looking for ways to soften the blow, to soften the collision that takes place when a faithful church meets a godless world. And I don't think we can do that. I, I think there, it's going to be messy and there's going to be yeah. uh, it's gonna, there's going to be conflict and disagreement. And, right. and that's the way it is. And that's why scripture puts such a premium on on uh, courage to the point that it tells us that cowards can't inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, yeah. You have to be courageous because we're called to fight a battle with a very real uh, enemy. But but the thing is, we're trying to overcome that enemy with love and and to uh, to draw uh, unbelievers into the same kingdom we're already a part of. Uh, right. So you know it's 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 different obviously than than what we might think of as other forms of warfare. But I, again, I think right. I think the problem is you have a lot of Christians who want to be pacifists when it comes to the culture war, and I don't think we right. can do that. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be a collision. We just have to accept mm -hmm. that that's how it's going to be. Well, I, you know, the, the, you, you quoted, um, I can't remember who the quote was, but you, I, I think it might've been Wendell Berry. Um, you talked about, um, you know, creation fights back, um, because it's, it's always on God's side. Um, and, and the thing that, the thing that I, that I'm seeing that I think is wonderful right now in the world that gives me a lot of hope that we're on the cusp of some sort of great revival is that again proverbs tells us that as you see a skillful man he will stand before kings um bezalel was filled with the spirit of wisdom and that looks like a craftsman who's really 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 good at their craft um but but there's a kind of reality check an embracing uh, uh, of the way that god created the world not a not a rejection of it or or a uh, a manipulation of it but but going with the grain understanding it that that i'm starting to see people outside of the church uh, and, and and this has always been the case um but but uh there are it, the the world still operates um the way god designed it to operate so people who go with the grain in any particular area are going to rise and um, they're going to succeed. And what's happening with guys like Jordan Peterson, or I'd say Joe Rogan, or even like right now you've got guys like Russell Brandt, you know, who who are who have been outside of the church, not interested in the church, not interested in the Word of God, but who are pursuing truth um, in a in an honest way. They're all converging right now on a lot of you know, a, a lot of conservative, uh, uh, Christian, or at least, you know, Judeo Christian truth, um, kind of all, all at the same time, all of these people are starting to come to this conclusion. Um, who's the other guy, Ruben, um, uh, who's got the show. Yeah, Dave, Gay Dave, Ru yeah, yeah. Dave Rubin, you know, I mean, he's, he's talking about being a theist now, you know, and, um, and I mean, it's just, it's, 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 fun to watch um because um because their pursuit of truth and their pursuit of the reality of the way things work um has led them to you know to 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 truth to lady wisdom yeah. to, to 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 christ uh, or, or is, is yeah. going to inevitably lead that way yeah at least in bits and pieces uh again yeah, i think right. you can begin to get the whole picture you know in, unless you really embrace christ and submit yourself to the word of god and and then use the word of god as the um lens through which you interpret the world and then you know your guide right. when you act in the world so uh but, you know in, i guess in, my point one of the points sorry to interrupt rich but because uh, I, I i i didn't put the period on the end of the sentence but the the point for me is is that culture war in addition to engaging and and there's going to be political fights and things like that one of the uh, to me one of the most obvious uh ways to engage in the culture war right now is to pursue excellence yeah. in whatever field you're in 
you know so if yeah. you're if you're in video or you're in marketing or you're in uh healthcare or whatever if you doggedly pursue wisdom in that area you're you're going to you're going to rise and you're going to make an impact and you're going to find yourself in a position um as we're seeing right now i mean in healthcare you're seeing this where you you've got people who um who just can't be silenced because they're too they're too excellent you know like they're too excellent in their field and they're fighting as hard as they can but guys like malone and and uh and mccullough it's like these guys who their their credentials are are impeccable and and um and and so here they are you know um standing in the in the uh city gates you know uh contending for for sanity um and reality um but they're only able to do it because they've pursued a spirit of wisdom in their particular field yeah. Yeah, and no, I, th I think you're exactly right, and, and the Proverbs teach us that as well, that uh, doing your work with excellence you know, does, does, I mean, like you said, you'll stand before kings. It, it leads you to a, a position of greater glory. And I, I think that's something that Christians do need to focus on. I, I love what, I mean, this goes back to Bezalel again. I mean, we've talked about him again and again, but he's yeah. filled with the Spirit of God and a spirit of wisdom. Right. Why? So he can be a really good carpenter. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. you know, I mean, that, that's why God gives him the spirit and gives him wisdom is so he can be a really good blue collar worker. OK, uh, so I, that may change the way we and challenge, you know, some of the ways that we think about wisdom or spirituality or what have you. But I, that, that's what we need. And uh, and I would say, yes, whatever field God calls you to. So, again, go back to my analogy of, you know, you have your bedroom, you've got your apartment, you have a house, you, you know, your domain right. is expanding over the course of life. OK, rule over that domain with excellence. Do whatever it is God's called you to do. You're the mayor of a town, the governor of a state, right. the president of a nation. As you progress, make sure that you do your work with excellence. And that doesn't mean becoming a workaholic. That's not wise either. Uh, but I think understanding that your vocation itself is a form of service to God and to neighbor, uh, that we do our work, Colossians 3 says, ultimately to Christ Jesus. Uh, and so, you know, if Jesus is your boss, okay, how are you going to do your work for him? If, if he's your, mm -hmm. if he's the one who's sort of you know, looking over your shoulder, so to speak, uh, how are you going to do your work if you're working for Jesus? And, uh, and I think that, that can, I, I th I've seen a lot of Christians who do very sloppy labor and I've seen a lot of Christians who do, you know, who yeah. really do excel in their work. And I think a lot of times ex a Christian who excels in his work, uh, all kinds of doors will open to, for him, not only to enlarge his own familial dominion, his, you know, his personal dominion, the dominion of his family, but all kinds of doors will open for the spread of the gospel. Totally. Especially because in today's society, I mean, let's face it, the bar is set pretty low uh, yes. in, in, because our, we live in a culture full of sluggards. And so if you show up and you're, you know, and you're like the ant in Proverbs 6 and you work hard and you show up on time and you don't complain and you have foresight, you plan ahead and you're, you know, you're just a, a diligent worker who's pursuing excellence all around Yes, Proverbs gives us, you know, Proverbs again describes patterns, not ironclad laws. It's not what happens 100% of the time, but it's what generally happens, the general pa patterns that we see in God's world. Yeah, that's going to lead you to a position of greater glory, dominion, influence, and that's what we want. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think um, the, the thing about all this that's so um, counter- runs counter to, to the way that that so many in the evangelical church think today is is that uh, pursuing God pursuing holiness pursuing wisdom um, is it has just been reduced to to, to evangelism maybe um, mm -hmm. and and knowing the gospel just knowing the gospel uh, and remembering it all the time, and then telling people about it um, again, the gospel very narrowly defined um, as as you know the 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 how to pray the prayer and accept Jesus as your savior so you can be saved. Um, and and the tragedy is that the world's burning around us, and Christians 
have nothing more to offer than an answer for um, what what to ha- you know where you'll go when you die, and and that's all we seem to be concerned with. And it seems like you're you're um, you know you're called all manner of things if you want to if you want to dig any deeper than that. Um, but what we're talking about is going all the way back to the the creation mandate, you know, of of take dominion of this place. I've given you this planet. You need a garden. I, w- I want you to grow up, become mature, figure it out, figure out how this whole place works, and f- and and take dominion over it, lord over it, rule over it well, organize it, structure it, uh, bless it, and uh, and fill it. You know, with with uh, with progeny who are, who will do the same um that's that seems to be and, and i love that you tied that story and that 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 com, those commandments given in genesis to the purpose of what's happening in proverbs and also to to christ and and i think you you went into this in the sermon as well that um that christ you know is also wisdom you know that that that, that there's a point um in the proverbs where where we see wisdom speaking and it seems very much like wisdom is maybe the second you know person of the trinity um talking about being there when when the uh you know when the foundations of the earth were laid well let me pick up on a few threads that that you um that you had going there so i think one one big problem that a lot of christians have today is they start with the great commission instead of the creation mandate and so then the chief end of life really is just to evangelize people. And, and obviously, evan- I'm not trying to downplay that in any kind of way. Sure. But uh, I mean, evangelization is important. But the Great Commission fits inside of the creation mandate. So the creation mandate is this, you know, it's, it's what we have at the beginning of the human race. And it describes and defines what human life is going to, what the human mission is all about. The Great Commission is given so that that creation mandate can be fulfilled. If you separate the Great Commission from the creation mandate, then the Great Commission is, you know, go and save souls instead of go and disciple nations. And there's a difference there. But but so so if we don't have if we don't start with the creation mandate, we end up actually truncating the Great Commission and we reduce the Great Commission to getting as many souls into heaven as we can. So people, you know, we try to convert people, give people, help people have a conversion experience so they can go to heaven when they die. Okay. But if you understand that the Great Commission is situated within the creation mandate, now the Great Commission is about building Christian nations, building Christian civilizations. It's not about just converting people. It's about discipling them. It's about transforming all of life so that banking and politics and education and finance and art and music and literature are all subordinated to the Lordship of Christ. They're all brought under the Lordship of Christ. So so it gives you a a much broader view. Now, here's another thing. When you separate the Great Commission from the the creation mandate, you also don't really know what to do with success. And, you know, in the world, we've seen a lot of people demonize success, you know, the attack on the 1%, soak the rich, all that kind of thing. And obviously there are people in in our world because our political and economic system is corrupt and has a lot of um, doors that are open to corruption. Uh, sometimes people do become wealthy at somebody else's expense. I mean, I, I, I fully acknowledge that. I fully acknowledge that there are problems in this in this area. But having said that, uh, you know, Proverbs again shows us that uh, authority, responsibility, and wealth will flow to the man who does excellent work. The man who is who is faithful and wise in, with his wife and in his work, he's going to be the man who excels. Uh, he's going to be the man who grows in prosperity. And the Bible is not the least bit embarrassed by that prosperity. A lot of times we focus on the warnings that come with prosperity. And th- and this is another thing that happens in Proverbs. Proverbs gives warnings about things that the Torah does not. Like nowhere does Moses warn people about being lazy, you know, and that's because going back to what you said, when you live basically in a wilderness, it's either work or die. And everybody knows that. When you live in a much more affluent society, now things like drunkenness or laziness become things you could actually do and still survive. 
And that's why Proverbs starts to warn about those things. The son of the king is not going to starve to death if he's lazy right away. Now, eventually it'll catch sure. up with him. Uh, or if he gets drunk, you know, I mean, he can, he can in some ways be insulated from the consequences of that for a while because he's surrounded by so much affluence and prosperity. So you have new temptations that come with this situation. But here, here's the key thing. Proverbs, along with the rest of the Bible, but you especially see this in Proverbs, describes wealth and we could say cultural influence or cultural power as great blessings, not anything right. to be suspicious of or ashamed of. I think just as the world has its version of demonizing the successful, I think you sometimes see that in the church too, where there is a lot of false guilt piled on people uh, for being successful. Um, I think a lot of this false guilt, you know, here in Birmingham, we had David Platt was here for a while. I think his book Radical, while it had some, you know, some good thoughts here and there, I think it was a real engine uh, for creating false guilt for people mm. uh, that, you know, how dare you uh, pay money to send your kid to take piano lessons when there are people starving in Africa, okay? Mm. As, as if those two things are directly connected in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, God wants... You know, people in his church growing up, knowing how to play piano well with skill to his glory. Uh, I mean, that that uh, is is a good thing, and it doesn't need any further justification. And mm -hmm. and 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 we should not be playing this game where we say, oh well, but there are people you know starving in another part of the world, so therefore you can't have nice things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really really clear in Scripture that even when the rich are practicing the kind of generosity that God calls them to, they're still going to be rich. They don't cease to belong to that category. I mean, Paul in 1 Timothy 6 is telling the rich what to do, and he doesn't tell them to stop being rich. Uh, it's, there, there's never this expectation that there will be no wealthy people among the people right. of God. A lot of the greatest saints in all of Scripture, like Abraham and Job, yeah. Uh, are yeah. people of immense wealth, or people like Daniel, who are who are who are, who are people of immense influence in the world? Right. So we have to stop demonizing success. We have to see that ambition can be a holy thing. You can have a selfish ambition. You can want to make money just for the sake of making money. Uh, you can want to uh, be the CEO just because you love the status that comes with that, and you want the praise of men. Or you can want to do all of those things to the glory of God because you're seeking right. to be a good steward and you're seeking to, uh, to, to, to take dominion faithfully right. and you want God to enlarge your realm for that reason. Right. And I think we yeah. have to recover. There, there, there's a real, we should not always be suspicious of success. We should not demonize success. We should not always be suspicious of ambition. There is a kind of good and healthy and godly, and I would say masculine ambition that ought to characterize Christian men that, uh, that a lot of times you just don't see in the church today. Well, it's been like as you said, it's been it's been kind of beat out of us, and um, and I don't think there's a framework. I think I think nesting uh, the 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 uh, Great Commission within the framework of the creation mandate um, is is you know one of the great um, tragedies of dispensationalism is kind of divorcing those things, and and there's also you add to that a a premillennial you know worldview eschatology. That it's all going to burn any minute now. I'm pr that's really what I'm praying for. I'm praying that qu Jesus would come back so quickly uh, and get us out of here because it's so terrible. Um, and so there's just this whole, the, you know, all of these things pile up to create a situation where we are we are um, disconnected from from reality. I mean, it's 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 disconnected from wisdom. We 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 we're running away from the world that God's placed us in. And 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 the the sort of um, the violence that's been done to the to the idea of what the gospel is, you know, the the gospel, as I understand it, in in the in the gospels, is the good news of the coming of the kingdom of Jesus. It's the good news that Jesus Christ, our King, has come, you know, and He is ruling, you know, He is He is He is ruling the universe, and we are His people, and we can rejoice that he is he is ruling and we can extend and, and our job is to go proclaim this good news and extend his kingdom extend the boundaries of his kingdom um everywhere we go as his ambassadors as 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 his uh um as his sons and daughters
Um, yeah, so I want to pick up on something you said there because you brought eschatology yeah. into this, and I think that that fits really well. It's important to understand Proverbs is a very post-millennial book, okay? Yeah, because yeah. Pro you cannot help but be optimistic or, or hopeful when you read the book of Proverbs because pr the whole point of Proverbs is to show us that God's ways work. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, you, t you talked about, you know, Jordan Peterson and, and a number of these different secular figures who seem to be at least in touch with bits and pieces of reality, not the whole, but bits and pieces of sure. it. I, I think part of what they are picking up on is that, yes, you can you can be a non-Christian and make these observations and see that God's ways work because God is God designed us. And so when God tells us how to live, that's going to fit with our design. It's going to work. Um, and when you reject God's design, it's like you're trying to put, you know, diesel fuel in a gas engine. It, I mean, it's just, it's just not going right. to work. Right. I, so, and, and I, you know, study after study comes out and confirms, you know, something about, um, you know, some truth of God's word or, or some command that God has given. I just saw one the other day that talked about how, um, you know, getting married really young has certain dangers. Sometimes there can be a higher divorce rate, but if you take out uh, couples who cohabitated, couples who lived together before marriage, then actually getting married young yeah. it, it can be a very good and successful thing. Uh, so so uh, you isolate out cohabitation. It's actually cohabitation that leads to marital wreckage down the line. You know, if and, and when the couple finally marries, it's got a very low probability of actually working out. Well, why is that? Well, it's because if you violate God's design by man and woman uh, having sex outside of marriage, living together before they're married, it, 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 you're going against uh, the deepest reality of your nature, the, the deepest reality of who you are as a man and woman made in the image of God, and, and you're violating the way God designed the male-female relationship to work. And so what happens? Bad things. Sometimes I think, I've, I've said this time and time again, I think it's really true. Sometimes I think the whole field of sociology exists in order to provide empirical data that shows us God's ways are best. Because it's like every time there's something, you know, it's like these studies come out and it's like, you know, lo and behold, uh, the way God designed the family is the best way. Best for, right. for mom and dad, right. husband, wife, and certainly best for the kids. Uh, you just go, you know, just do this in every area of life. And you can see, yeah, the way God has commanded us to live, it actually does work. If you want to be successful right. and prosperous and happy, live life the way God commands us in his word. Right. Right. Well, you started the sermon saying, you know, saying that that idolatry, um, that when humans worship idols, they lose their humanity. And and I think that sums up everything you've just said very, very well that 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 um, and I don't think this is um, this is emphasized enough or, or understood enough either is this idea that 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 when you abandon the God who created mankind, um, then you you are you are abandoning uh you're abandoning your humanity you are you are and and you are going to descend further and further into um something that 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 is grotesque and um and debased and uh and obviously unfulfilling um and so and so yeah this is this is what the this is the good news you know the good news of the gospel is that the god of the universe um, really has, really does love us. It really does have a design for creation, um, and for us. And, uh, and he's given it to us. He's not hiding it from us. He's, he's, he's laid it out for us and he wants us to, uh, to en en enjoy it and embrace it. Um, so yeah, I'll, that's, I'll, that's, yeah, really, that's, that's really good, Larson. And I'll just throw one other thing in about that, because I think we're entering into a, uh, a, a phase in which we're going to have really new and different opportunities for evangelism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the you know the kind of evangelism that came out of the Reformation and that that was that was uh, workable and effective for a long period of time presupposed that even if people didn't have Christian hearts, they had Christian consciences. And so, for example, they felt guilty about things. And so, you could appeal to that sense of guilt and say, you know, you need forgiveness. You know, you haven't lived yeah. up to 
to uh, the, the standards of righteousness. And so uh, you deserve death and hell. And so uh, you can't do anything to save yourself. Uh, your good deeds can never outweigh your bad deeds. And so you've got to give up trying to save yourself and, and trust in Jesus and what he did for you. That kind of gospel presentation, and I, I mean, obviously, that will always be an element of what we, what we proclaim sure. to people, uh, because obviously that's true. But I think, that, I think the issue today, it's not that people feel guilt. Uh, in fact, a lot of times the, the non-Christians are extremely smug in their self-righteousness. I actually think mm -hmm. that the whole woke progressive left I mean, they are the Pharisees of, of today. Uh, they are the self-righteous, legalistic ones who are binding rules on people that nobody can keep and constantly moving the goalposts so that you know nobody can ever uh, feel like they've actually... I mean, they, they are the Pharisees of today, the woke, uh, in the church and outside of the church. But I think, I think we now are entering into a, a cultural situation where people are experiencing a great deal of fear and hopelessness and confusion. And I think we can bring the gospel to people and say, look, um, I mean, one, one avenue that I've seen open up a lot of conversations about the gospel is people who are frustrated in their marriage or frustrated with their kids. And, and it's because, they, because they've rejected Jesus, they've rejected reality when it comes to those things. And so they, if you just go by you know, the things the culture is telling you about how men and women are to relate to one another, your, your, your marriage yeah. probably is going to be a disaster. Uh, because the reality is, while culture has changed, human nature in a fundamental way is not. Men are still men. Women are still women. Men are always you know, are attracted to the same things they used to be, and women are still attracted to the same things they used to be. And, and if you don't understand those differences between men and women and how the polarity between them is what drives attraction, you're going to have a hard time making a marriage work. And that can become an entryway into you know, it, it's a creational issue. They don't understand creation, but that becomes an entryway to getting somebody to the gospel. Um, I mean, obviously, you can't really talk about the gospel without talking about the uh, Jesus and the church, you know, the, the, the bride and the bridegroom. Uh, or, or another example, well, there, there's a lot of examples of this I could, I could give you. I think one that comes out of COVID is fear and the fear of death. And this is another opportunity, another way for us. We need gospel presentations now that are tailored to people who are absolutely dominated by feelings of despair and hopelessness and, and especially a fear of death. And Hebrews 2 presents Jesus. You know, that, that's one of the ways Satan holds people in bondage is through the fear of death. Yeah. What, what, what breaks you free? What, what breaks the bonds? What breaks the chains of fearing death? What's well, Jesus? And so maybe we don't appeal so much to people's sense of guilt as we do to people's fear of death. Uh, and, 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 and now, you know, Jesus is the answer to this human dilemma, you know, that we are encountering and seeing people encounter. So I think there's a real hopelessness and a real pessimism and despair about things. And I think if we Christians are joyful and hopeful, there was actually, um, I don't remember who, who the pagan was, but there was one pagan who about the third century or so, uh, describing the Christian church. He said of the Christians, he said, they alone know how to live. It's kind of like, you know, we've all been trying to figure out the right way to live. And we've had different, you know, Greek philosophers and Roman politicians and so forth, all telling us, you know, maybe this is the right way to live. None of us have found the key. Uh, and this pagan, just observing how the Christians lived, their marriages, their, how they mothered and fathered their kids, their community life, how they worked, uh, on the job, he said, they alone know how to live. That's what we need people in the world to say about us today. Those Christians, we may think they have some crazy ideas, but they certainly know how to live. They, they, they are clearly living in accord with right. the design. Well, it's, it's, I think the thing that's, again, that's such a blessing about what's going on with COVID and, and, and the, the, the gross, you know, uh, oversteps, um, and, and, and really I would say strategic blunders that, that, that the left is making right now is they're going so far and they're overplaying their hands so, so much that they're, they're kind of red pilling, a, they're, they're forcing a bunch of people who have been happily plugged into the matrix for so long, you know, been happy to look at, at celebrities and the lifestyle that TV and movie sells and said, that looks good. That's what I want. I'm going to imitate what they do. You know, they have, 
they have uh, casual sex with with everybody and they don't they don't marry they don't have kids they don't um you know they get to be whatever they want if they just think it hard enough and want it bad enough it'll just happen and you know there's just there have been people who have just happily um bought in you know to to and and the thing that you said too um about foolishness you know as opposed to if wisdom is understanding is a reality check and understanding how God designed the world, you, you described it as as um, wisdom or a proverb is a um, it's basically a moral you know cause and effect. It's it's a it's a it's it's Patterns basically describing a pro- yeah. yeah a pattern of reality a property of reality that, that you know um, we've we've got so many um, philosophies, ideologies today that, um, that as long as you're plugged into the matrix, these things seem to work, you know, um, uh, transgenderism is one of them, but, but, but the, the whole idea of, you know, of, of being a career woman and being able to have whatever you want, you know, you can have kids and you can have, um, a, a high powered career and, uh, and it all just works, you know, um, biology and it you know, doesn't, doesn't play into it, um, at all. Um, there's any number of a zillion things, um, you know, abortion, you know, abortion is, is something that's, uh, that's, uh, um, you know, that, that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't leave a, a mark, you know, on your soul, um, and doesn't, doesn't, uh, rip your, your soul apart. Um, it's it's easy you know it's it's easy and it's a it's a great decision to make right um so anyway all of this stuff i just feel like we've we've been living in the matrix and and the fact that our government um our politicians have have thought that they they had this i think false sense that they they really had us um where they want us and could really do whatever they want and they were they've been surprised by things like the you know the 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 convoy of truckers in Canada who are basically saying, "Okay, we're done with this," and it's causing all of these people from all these unusual places. I, Russell Brand, if you haven't if you haven't looked at Russell Brand on have you have you seen what he's doing? I have not. You have to look that up. It's, it's so. I mean, he this is a guy who's one of the most brash, crude, uh, anti-Christian you know uh, actors that's you know and comedians uh, in 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 Hollywood. And he's being he's being labeled now by media as a as like a right wing extremist, you know, because he's uploading videos every day, just pointing at these glaring lies, you know, that are that the left are are putting out there. Um, it's just fascinating. Um, but anyway, I, all of it to say, I, th- I think this is this is one of the this is one of the the interesting things I, I've heard a lot of people describe it as. Uh, you know, revelation, the term revelation or apocalypse means an unveiling, you know, uh, and, and we are living in apocalyptic times where, where, um, where things are being, you know, things, things are being pulled back and we're, we're, we're able to see kind of behind the curtain, you know, who's pulling the strings and what they're up to. Yeah, and, that is and, so and, true. Uh, I mean, exciting. It, it, I've not seen Russell Brand lately, but uh, it, it does, you know, it does not take very much to get labeled as an extremist. <laughs> <laughs> today. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, you know, like I said, the, there's a kind of collective insanity that I think has gripped yeah. the culture. And I think, uh, you know, COVID maybe accelerated that. Uh, but again, you know, Proverbs says, all those who hate me love death. I think that's what you're seeing mm-hmm. in our culture. Romans 1 describes this process, that when man suppresses the truth about God, uh, he also ends up suppressing the truth about everything else. Uh, so you, it's not like you can get rid of God and hang on to truth and morality and all these other things. No, it, it, it you know, it all goes together. Uh, I yep. mentioned Nietzsche earlier, but this is where I think Nietzsche is really helpful because Nietzsche kind of called the bluff. You know, he, he, the, the, you had this kind of enlightenment, rationalism, secularism arising, uh, that basically said, you know, we can, we can, we can use reason instead of scripture as our authority and we can build a morality and a coherent worldview just out of reason. And Nietzsche basically called their bluff and said, no, you can't. <laughs> he said, if you get rid of God, you got to get rid of everything else too. 
uh, and, and you're fooling yourself. I mean, at one point he says, I, I, I fear we have not really gotten rid of God because we still use grammar. I mean, like he understood mm. the, the connection between things that, uh, you know, if you're going to have grammar, yeah. you're presupposing God, you know, just, just yeah. by, by speaking. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's where we are. We, we are facing collective insanity. Uh, mm. th 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 there is uh, a deep fear that's gripped our culture. Uh, there is this despond. I mean, all you have to do is get on Twitter and you will yeah. see, um, you know, there was a, a, a tweet that a Christian pastor put out just in the last couple of days, just something very basic about, you know, um, decency and modesty on social media. And the response is just people went crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's not even that they, that there was like a reasonable disagreement. People just went like, you could just, you could just reading the tweets, you could just sense the, <laughs> the, the anger right, and, right. and, and the fear and, and the misery. I mean, that's, we, we, we now are living in a culture that is full of anger and misery. Yes. And that's sad. And we as Christians, we, we should want to do something about it and, and, and we can help people out of their anger and their misery. Right. You don't have to live in anger and misery all the time. Well, it's 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 driven by, you know, to bring it back to where we started, the therapeutic turn. And and um, and I think I think the sinister thing about the therapeutic turn um, is that uh, our feelings have really become deified and, and we have really become deified. You know, you you are a god um, and and whatever it is you want to be, whatever it is you want to have um, is is yours by rights, you know, um, because you, just because, you know, that's, that's, that's how it is. Um, and, um, and, and so I, you know, we're, we're, we're in this, we're in this, uh, this, this place now where, um, truth telling is hate speech. Um, and Christians who, who just want to say basic truths, um, are, are now being canceled and censored. Um, and, uh, and it's bringing about just all manner of, of rage. Um, and it is a, you know, I, you, you kind of gave a warning in your sermon that, 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 um, you know, while, while there's, there's hope, you know, uh, and, and I, I have a lot of hope. Uh, um, I mean, I ultimately have, have a great deal of hope, but, but, but I have a lot of hope about the times we're living in. Um, as I see these kind of truth seekers starting to, to in the public square, um, you know, YouTube and podcasts are, are the printing press of our time. And there's this revolution of, of, you know, it's never been easier to, to, um, publish information and, and disseminate it throughout the world. Um, it's the same kind of thing that happened um, with the printing press. And, and I know that, that it's been said that the, the, um, that the, Rev, the, that the reformation couldn't have happened without the printing press. And I think, and I think we're in a similar time that, that, that because of this technology and because it hasn't, this, this technology hasn't been captured yet. Um, ha hasn't, they haven't found ways to shut it down and control it. Um, uh, we're experiencing, I think, perhaps we're living during a time of, of reformation but um but the warning is that um is that in the short term at least um progressives are going to um point to christians and our resistance to their crazy um their crazy policies that have no basis in reality um, our resistance, our truth telling and saying, no, you can't just pay money not to work, you know, pay people money not to work and, and, our, and have a healthy economy. Our resistance is going to be pointed to as evidence for why it didn't work. You know, when it ultimately work, doesn't work, um, they're going to point to Christians and they've done that. We've seen that with, with coronavirus, you know, where it's all those back backwards Christians who won't get vaccinated that are a problem. Um, if only they get vaccinated. The same is going on with global warming. You know, it's, it's those Christians who just keep having babies, uh, and keep driving, you know, minivans. They're the ones who are who are really causing this problem. 
we need to do something about those guys. Yeah, I think you're right. Or another example of this is if you uh, point out the, the truth about sex and gender against transgender ideology that you cannot, a man cannot become a woman and a woman cannot become a man, well, then you're killing people because that your disapproval is going to make that transgender kid go kill himself. And what will happen right. is the progressives, instead of saying, well, maybe, maybe we, you know, maybe there's something uh, to that and we should uh, find another way of dealing with a person who experiences gender transphoria, dysphoria, uh, they will blame the Christian who has spoken truth and say, it's your fault. You become the scapegoat uh, again and again and again, this happens. So instead of backtracking and repenting and saying, well, maybe we need to go back and reconsider things, they'll double down on their blue pill fantasy and right. uh, continue to scapegoat Christians. And, and we have to understand that that's where we are. And, and again, that's why it takes courage to speak truth in a culture like ours, because it is so depraved and wicked. And again, in, in, in rejecting God, our culture has rejected reality. Um, but, but reality keeps breaking through. That's, that's the, so, you know, why be hopeful? Well, you know, you, you talked about how, you know, nature fights back because I mean, the creation is God's creation. It's on God's right. side. On God's side yeah. Exactly. And so you can't deny these fundamental truths about men and women or about human economies or what have you. You can't deny them for long without getting all right. kinds of negative feedback. And at least some people, when they get they get that negative feedback, will start to rethink things and say, "Hey, maybe right. I've maybe I need to back up and try something else." Yeah. And sooner or later, yeah, I need some people to real repentance. Yeah, that's right. And and again, you know, they're going to blame they're going to blame the high suicide rate amongst uh, you know people who are gay or 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 have uh, gender dysphoria on on bullying um, and and not on the fact that these people have serious have serious uh, 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 psychological problems, and they're and they're and they're trying to you know you, you don't um, I've heard I've heard uh, Ben Shapiro say things like you know he, he had a he had a a relative who who had some form of dementia or, or um, um, psychosis who you know who thought that or or maybe his OCD and he thought that you know um, he thought his hands were always dirty and he'd wash them over and over and and the love and, and until they bled, you know, and the, the loving thing would not be to say, yeah, your hands are your hands need to keep, you just keep washing them, keep washing them. Let's 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 all accept. Let's all accept your your feelings. Um, the, the loving thing is to stop them and say what you what you think is true is not true. And if you keep going this route, you're going to hurt yourself. Right. Um, um, the. Uh, so so you know that that's happening and um uh and, and but nature's on our side um nature's on god's side uh because it, it it'll it'll it, he he's the create creator of, of nature um and so and so we want to be bold and courageous um to continue to pursue truth and pursue goodness and beauty and uh and um serve the lord um I want to I want to pivot if we can. Um, I know we've been talking for a long time, but but I'm I'm really enjoying this, and I think we can you know um, if if you've got the time, um, I want to pivot to Ecclesiastes because mm -hmm. because it's 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 the other side of the coin of wisdom. You know if 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 um, if wisdom um, in Proverbs is a reality check, um, then then um, it sure seems like at a casual you know, um, skim through Ecclesiastes, it seems very different. It seems like it almost sounds in some ways, uh, worldly, like just do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it almost feels nihilistic, you know, I think t to a casual observer, um, when you read passages from Ecclesiastes. So what, what, what's going on in Ecclesiastes? Well, yeah, so uh, it's not nihilistic. In fact, it too is a very hopeful book. But again, it's a, <laughs> to use the same metaphor again, it's a red pill book. It, it's, it's dealing with reality. It, 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 Ecclesiastes does not give us the world as we wish it were, but the world as it actually is, which is this wildly unpredictable and uncontrollable 
thing. Right. And, and, and so Proverbs, Ecclesiastes grapples with that. So think about it this way, the way Proverbs and Ecclesiastes complement each other. And I, I, I say, you know, Proverbs is wisdom for the young man. Ecclesiastes is wisdom for the mature man. You know, when you've started to realize, okay, not everything works out just the way that mom and dad said it would, or the Proverbs said it would, the world's a little more complicated than that. How do you deal with that? Proverbs is about the blessing of wisdom, the benefits of wisdom. Ecclesiastes is about the limits of wisdom. The way Gandalf puts it, <laughs> uh, not that he was trying to summarize Ecclesiastes, but I think it's a good summary. Even the wise cannot see all ends. Uh, the question really that Solomon is dealing with is what good is your wisdom if wisdom does not give you ultimate control and leverage over things? If the wise man and the fool are both going to die and might end up buried right next to each other in the cemetery, what good was the wise man's wisdom if he and the fool both go to the same place? Or what good is your wisdom if your successor to the throne might come after you and mess everything up, which is, of course, exactly what happened with Solomon. He builds the temple, builds glory, you know, Israel to its to its zenith, to its most glorious yeah. state. And, and then his son comes along and wrecks the whole thing. And uh, because of Rehoboam's foolishness, the kingdom is split in, you know, into north and south. And so everything Solomon worked to build is now, and of course, Solomon himself played a role in that too, even before his death, but with his unfaithfulness. But Rehoboam wrecks it, his successor wrecks it. So what good was all of Solomon's wisdom if his son was a fool? So it, it deals with questions like that. Uh, the, 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 part of the problem I think with Ecclesiastes is a lot of the English translations say, va you know, say vanity, vanity, all is vanity at the beginning. And they keep using that word vanity or right. um, sometimes even meaninglessness, which is a really bad translation. It's actually vapor, 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 all is vapor. And if you want a, just a, a nice little summary of what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about, James, in James chapter four, I think it's verses 13 to 17, picks up on this theme of vapor. And he's talking about the Christian businessman who says, you know, we're going to go to this city and then go to that right. city and we're going to make money on these business trips. And what he says is, you ought to say, if God wills it, because your life is a vapor, your life is but a mist. Okay, that is Ecclesiastes. Don't pretend like you have control over your life or leverage over your life because you do not. And so what is the answer? Okay, the faith, well, let, let me put it this way. Wisdom can only get us so far. I mean, wisdom is right. wonderful. There are blessings and benefits that come with wisdom, but wisdom, the kind of wisdom that we are able to have is, is not our ultimate weapon in overcoming death or, or defeating death. Ultimately, we have to trust God and rest in him. I, I think Ecclesiastes really is describing what the life of um, wise faithfulness looks like. Now, in the sermon, what I did is I, I picked up how, you know, in, in daily life, we're confronted with all kinds of situations for which there's not a clear cut script. Uh, there's not a clear cut law or command. So, I, you know, you don't have to pray and ask God or you don't need wisdom to know whether or not you should be shoplifting next time you go to the store. God has said, thou shalt not steal. It's black and white. You know exactly what that means. There's no question about God's will for you next time you go to the store. It's to pay for every item you carry out with you. Right. But there are a lot of situations we face in life, a lot of decisions we face in life where there is no clear cut command. And this is where wisdom comes in. So, and I think this is part of what Ecclesiastes deals with. Think about when Solomon first becomes king, the first big situation he's got to deal with is two women who are fighting over one baby. Whose baby is yep. this? Because one woman rolled over and crushed her baby in the night and she took the other woman's baby and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. Well, there's no yep. law you can go to uh, in the Torah of Moses that tells you how to resolve that kind of dispute. So Solomon has to take the law that he has and he has to take the wisdom that he has, knowing what he, he knows about human nature, and in this case, especially maternal nature, what he knows about mothers, and he devises a wise solution to the problem. He had no intention to have the baby cut in half, but he knew if he right. commanded for the baby to be cut in half, the real mother would reveal herself. And that's, of course, exactly right. what happened. So right. a lot of life, a lot of life, you know, what does, what does Solomon do? He wings it. 
Okay, you just have to wing it sometimes. And and if you have uh, imbibed God's wisdom, if you have uh, you know, if you've internalized God's law and you've internalized the principles and patterns of wisdom, the natures of things as Proverbs describes it, then you will be in a position to deal with those situations for which there is no clear cut rule. I think in the right. sermon, I might, might use the example of the pilot Sully, uh, yeah. you know, the plane took off in New York City, I think from LaGuardia, and the engines sucked in a bunch of geese. Mm -hmm. that he's not going to be able to fly his plane. And so then he had to figure out what to do. And in a very short matter of time, mm -hmm. he had to figure out how to safely land a, a plane full of a couple hundred passengers. Highway wasn't an option because all the cars there. You're talking about New York City. You know, there's people living everywhere. There's everywhere, skyscrapers. Yeah. There's apartment buildings. It's not like you got open fields out in the countryside. He quickly realized the only place he could land the plane and preserve human life would be the river. Problem with the river landing is that you know you uh, you, you tip the nose a little too far, or you're off to right. the side a little bit. You know you can it just you have a disaster on your hands. He had to improvise. Okay, there is a lot of there are a lot of situations in life we face where we find ourselves somewhere between the geese getting sucked into the engine and trying to land the plane. Okay, and that's where we are. You yeah, know, the, the, totally. the geese just got sucked into the jet engine, and now what? Do you, what next? Okay, you can't land over here. You can't land. How, what are you going to do? You got to figure things right. out. And, and I think that that's a really good picture of what faithful improvisation looks like. Sully right. was able to faithfully improvise because he was a really good pilot, and 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 he had you know he had mastered the skill or the craft. Of flying, we, we could say he had a, right. he had a lot of wisdom about airplanes, and that's what right. allowed him to land the plane safely. And and so, if you have a lot of wisdom about parenting, then when you're faced with uh, a child who you know two kids fighting over a toy, or a uh, you know a, a teenage kid who wants to date maybe before you think they're ready, mm -hmm. or a, a kid who's failing a class at school okay there, there may not be a really clear-cut rule that tell that's that, that speaks to that situation but because you have uh imbibed the wisdom you, because you become a master of, of 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 the craft of this particular area of life now you know what to do you can wing it faithfully right right well there's so many there's so many things to talk about um in, in that in that um in that child example, you know, I, th I think of one of the things I, I, uh, I'm, I'm big on this idea of improv and, and wisdom and the fact that there, you know, th there's a difference between, there's a difference between a mistake and a sin, you know, for starters. Right. So as, as leaders, as a leader, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm leading in my, in, in some different aspects of my life. And, and uh, and I know that I'm I make mistakes, you know, and I will make mistakes, and I do make mistakes, and and we we uh, we suffer for those in different ways. Um, uh, but there's a difference between between a mistake. I couldn't do my job if I thought that making a mistake was sin, you know, that it was a sin. Like I, I just wouldn't. I'd never make a decision. I, I would spend all my time, um, you know, with a with a bible concordance just trying desperately to come up with the perfect rule i think that um i think a lot about ron paul when i think about wisdom um because I, I, th I think of ron paul and libertarianism as this pseudo wisdom you know that that um and, and what i what i i say about ron paul and 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 i always use the the example of solomon with the with the uh, babies or splitting the baby in half, right? Um, is, is, you know, I, I could program a, um, I, I could write a computer program that would vote identically to the way that Ron Paul voted uh, in, in his time as a as a legislator. You know, um, just program it to vote no every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, I mean that 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 would be the easy way. Um, yeah, that'd be the easiest way. But 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 truthfully, I mean, he he. I think we we admire his principles, and his uh, and his and his consistency. Um, but I don't see that as being all that admirable. You know, yeah. to me, it's a it's a it's a 
it's a dereliction of duty at some at some level you're we didn't hire you to be a robot you know we didn't elect you to be a robot we elected you to exercise wisdom and, and yeah to I, that, that that's actually a good analogy i mean certainly there there, there, there are some principles about libertarianism that that i can appreciate but i think of you're course. exactly right it is substituting the wisdom of statecraft it, it's substitutes substituting some kind of formulaic approach for the wisdom of statecraft right. uh, to actually know how to govern a people does require wisdom because you, you are going to be confronted with with situations where you have to weigh various things in the balance and and you know i mean it, 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 here here's another here, here's another aspect of this and this really played out in COVID. i think um, thomas Sowell says this but i think it's very wise we have to learn to think in terms of trade-offs rather than solutions. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes shows us that there are some problems in a fallen world that just can't be solved. There are some things that just aren't going to be fixed this side of the resurrection. The world's fallen. The world's broken. The world's crooked. Who can make it straight? If the world has been twisted, who, who among us has the, the power to untwist the world? Uh, so there, there are all... So, so, any solution you propose will have a whole new set of problems. And our, our politicians are constantly proposing solutions where they only talk about the upsides and they don't see about the down, anything about the downsides. We have to learn to think yeah. in terms of trade-offs rather than solutions. So you're faced with COVID. What trade-off do you want to make? That's right. Deaths that are going to happen to the, uh, to the most vulnerable people in the population, probably no matter what you do, or all of the consequences that will come from completely shutting down and potentially wrecking an economy. And I think, I think COVID is a good example of where we had a lot of politicians who were thinking in terms of solutions instead of trade-offs. And so to, to sell their solution, they weren't honest about the downsides to the solution. Right. I don't even think they were honest with themselves about the downsides to the solutions right. they proposed. You know, do you wanna right. mask every kid in school with the hope that these kids who are really hardly at any risk at all whatsoever anyway, you know, you're going to do that uh, and make that a kind of solution to the problem or recognize that, no, actually, there's going to be a trade off there because there are a lot of there's a lot of downsides to putting kids in masks all day long, uh, just in terms of their human development and human interaction and uh, just general health. So. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, that, that's another thing is that wisdom will recognize that a lot of times there's not going to be a perfect solution. Uh, a lot of times you are going to have to accept some, I mean, landing your plane in the Hudson River is not a perfect solution. <laughs> I mean, because at least, you're, I mean, it's a trade-off, okay? But Sully made the trade-off. This plane is, you know, it's going to be consequences from it landing in the river because planes don't belong in rivers. Uh, but... Uh, it was the best possible trade-off that could have been made under those circumstances. And I think that's, that's how we have to learn to think is, is not just in terms of, because there's, there's a, like you said, if you, if you were a perfectionist and you believe that every mistake you might make uh, is a sin, okay, then you can't, you, you're, that paralyzes you into inactivity. You can't do anything right. at that point because right. any decision you make is going to hurt somebody's feelings or will have some kind of down, you know, if that goes back to the empathy thing, or it's going to have some kind of downside, but what wisdom, wisdom kind of frees you that if you understand wisdom as the art of faithful improvisation, it really frees you to, to be honest about the downsides. Yes, this, this, making this decision will have some downsides. But uh, in terms of the trade-offs being made, it's still the right way for us to go. Um, right. Life does not present you with a wish list. Life presents you with a set of options. Right. Wisdom is choosing the best among the available options. Right. You might. Well, I. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh well, you're 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 dead on, and and one of the things that I that frustrates me, um, well, it doesn't frustrate me, but something I observe, um, that can be frustrating is, is people who, haven't, embraced this aspect of reality you know this 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 the wisdom of ecclesiastes this idea that that wisdom is faithful improv um and especially if you've been sort of institutionalized you know in public school and in a corporate job um where you've never really had to make decisions you know you've always been given a very clear set of instructions and 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 your career 
you know, you can expect your raises. You know, if I just check all the boxes, I'm going to get these raises and it's going to, you know, I know exactly where it's going. Um, if, if that's your whole reality and that's the only thing you've experienced in life, then you're, you're going to perpetually be very frustrated by the leadership uh, it, that, that you're sitting under, whether it's at church or it's, or it's at your company, because what you're going to see inevitably is leaders changing course um, is leaders making compromises, making decisions that, that have downsides and, and you see this in people who shop churches, you, know, you, you get the, you know, there's, there's one kind of church shopping that we're not talking about here. I'm talking about the people that we see in our circles who are just absolute perfectionists and they're looking for the church that does all of it right. And as soon as they slip up, you know, as soon as like, well, I don't think they handled that situation. Well, I, I'm out the door mm. and, um, and they're, and they're intolerable, but, but, but I think you add, you know, the libertarianism thing, the systematic theology thing, you know, there's, there's a, the way I, I like to describe it, cause it's a kind of idolatry is, is, is I think one way to look at it is instead of, um, instead of believing that I serve a, a living God who does hold all things together, um, but who has given me autonomy has given me wisdom, um, uh, and, and instead of being in relationship with him through his word and through prayer, uh, just constant prayer, um, instead of that, um, being sort of how I approach life, which I think is, is what you, the conclusion you draw in Ecclesiastes is Ecclesiastes is about just living by faith, um, ultimately. Um, but instead of doing that, I am going to set up on my mantle, um, all these gods, these, these small gods, you know, free market economics or Calvinism or, um, or whatever, you know, homeschooling, you know, classical Christian education or courtship, whatever the, the little, you know, ideology is. And when it comes time to make that difficult decision you talked about where I've got a teenager who, who, who wants to date in, you know, before, before it's appropriate, um, the, the, the knee jerk is to, is to go pray instead of, instead of seeking wisdom, instead of praying for the situation, asking God to help you to faithfully improvise, right? Um, you pray to the God of, of, of courtship, you know, and, and well, let me open the manual and, and what, what is this, you know, what, what, what does this say I'm supposed to do? Um, which again, go back to Solomon telling the, the prostitutes to, to, yeah. to split the baby that, 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 uh, that's not in the playbook. Yeah, you're right. And, and I think you've tapped into something really important there, which I have seen a lot in Christian circles where because wisdom is hard and because wisdom is risky and because wisdom is honest about the downsides of a decision we might make, we often go about looking for substitutes for wisdom. Charismatics will substitute God told me because there's comfort in thinking, well, this is really God. I'm not, I didn't make this decision. God did. Okay. Um, now I think you talk about deifying your feelings, that's deifying your inner voice. So that, you know, there's a problem with that. God doesn't speak that way. In fact, the whole point of wisdom, the reason we need wisdom is because we don't have God, like the Holy Spirit doesn't become this inner GPS that then guides you robotically everywhere you need to go. You, right. you, you've got to make decision. God wants you to grow up and be a mature image bearer. You got to grow in wisdom. God's not going to make every decision for you. That's the whole point. I've seen people substitute what sometimes is called worldview thinking for wisdom. I mean, I think totally. it is Absolutely. necessary to develop a Christian worldview. That's a good and helpful thing. But there's a way of doing worldview that sometimes pops up in our circles that really becomes a substitute for wisdom. I think maybe this is kind of what you're getting at with your libertarian example. Libertarianism becomes a worldview that then provides an answer key ahead of time for every question That's you right. might encounter. So you don't That's need right. to really consider the problem You've already got the answer. You already know. You kind of got this shortcut. And again, I don't think that's yeah. really how wisdom works. Some people substitute techniques or methods. I think you see that a lot in the, in, in, you know, you talked about courtship. I mean, there's a lot of people who want a, a, a set of techniques or a, a really clear cut method that if you follow this method, your kids will get married or you'll find a spouse. That, and again, it doesn't work that way. And I, I actually think you can create all kinds of disasters because not every situation is the same, not every relationship's gonna look the same because people are 
complex because people are mysterious and not machines. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna encounter um, situations that the method or the technique can't handle. But if that's your go-to, it's just gonna create a lot of problems. So there is no substitute for wisdom. Now, wisdom might develop some methods, wisdom might develop some techniques, but wisdom will hold on to them wisely, which means with a kind of flexibility. There's gonna be an understanding that, hey, the world is a, is a complicated and messy place. Right. You just read Proverbs and the world looks pretty simple. Okay, but, it, but that's why you need Proverbs and Ecclesiastes together. Ecclesiastes reminds you of the complexity of it. Okay, Proverbs kills your radical Christianity uh, because it tells you that living an ordinary Christian life with excellence is good. Ambition and work and you know, family, all these blessings are good. So it kills your radical Christianity. But Ecclesiastes kills your perfectionistic Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is everything's got to be just right. I've got to have the perfect right. you know, solution to every problem. Ecclesiastes reminds you, no, there will be no perfect solution to a lot of the problems you face. Every decision you have to make, and I think Proverbs is especially helpful for leaders because it reminds you um, every decision you make will have a downside. And that's the, way, that's the way life is in a fallen world because all is vapor. You're never going to be able to handle and, and steer and control the vapor the way you want. Well, I, I love that you brought out the, the God told me um, kind of deifying your inner voice concept because I think that's a, that's a, that is idolatry. That's a form of idolatry. It's a really pernicious and, and, uh, and, um, and almost ubiquitous in the South, you know, in the Bible Belt form of idolatry that, that, um, that's just accepted um, as – as normal, I, I I had a I had a conversation with a pastor a year or two ago who who um, who asked me to come to breakfast and and tell me about a church split, you know, or a, a really difficult situation in his church that, that resulted in the split. And as he's describing it, a, a big part of it um, was was the result of. Um, a series of, de of decisions that were made on the basis of, um, of, a f of basically a feeling, you know, a feeling that, that, uh, he had, you know, as he was reading scripture, he sort of read into it, his own, you know, his own ideas about what, what he should do with his life and his church. And, and it had, had bad consequences. And, and that was the, that was the takeaway. One of the big takeaways I, I left him with after our conversation was, uh, your theology about how God speaks to you is bad and unbiblical, and you need to you need to you need you need to do away with it because it's it's bad. Um, it's also really manipulative. People can use it to manipulate, especially leaders. Uh, absolutely. When you come and absolutely. say God, I mean, I, I I don't know if you ever listened to much of the the Mars Hill uh, podcast that Christianity Today did on, on Mark Driscoll. Yeah. But one thing that, and I didn't get through the whole thing, and that it's a whole separate discussion. I'm not trying to yeah. open that whole can of worms. But one thing that stood out to me, if you ask, okay, what went wrong with Mark Driscoll? When you combine a leader who has a very powerful personality, a strong personality, but has virtually no accountability. So there, there, was, a, there was a church polity issue there. There was no accountability structure totally. for him. But when you combine that with just a, just a touch of charismatic theology, where that leader then can say, God told me, Oh wow, that's just a recipe for disaster. Because Absolutely. now, if you have it, if you have a disagreement, well, okay, you're not just disagreeing with Mark Driscoll; you're disagreeing with God. And there's a great story uh, from Charles Spurgeon. You know, Spurgeon built up this huge church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, and uh, a man came to Spurgeon, kind of a traveling pastor, and he said, "God told me that I'm supposed to preach in your church next week." <laughs> And Spurgeon said, God hasn't told me anything about it. <laughs> so it's not happening. Yeah, well, tell him to tell me. <laughs> so if the Holy Spirit scheduled to speak, I mean, he would have let me know too, you know. Yeah, right, uh, right. So I, I, which I appreciate. I mean, Spurgeon could, could, could see through that and just say, no, you're not going to manipulate me into, you know, right. getting my pulpit. I'm, I'm not going to let that right. happen. I'm going to make a rational and wise decision as a leader of this body what's best for us. And not let your inner voice, you know, uh, which you're confusing with the voice of God, dictate what we do. Well, I think I think the 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 point here is that um, we have this temptation 
Um, you know, we wish that we wish that there wasn't an Ecclesiastes. We wish that there was just a lot more Proverbs. We wish that, that, that there was a whole, you know, the Bible was just Proverbs end to end. And we just had a how-to manual down to the nth degree of, for everything. And, and it's laziness um, or it's lack of courage, you know, that, that, that drives us to these different idols, whether it's, whether it's, you know, deifying your, your, uh, your inner voice and, and using that in a manipulative way or, or it's, it's copping out, you know, being a little bit of a Pharisee and, and, um, and, you know, it, it, the funny thing as you, as you talk about, like, I, I think about wayward children whose parent I have this conversation I've had this conversation so many times with with Christian parents who have wayward kids and you and and you ask them about it and they go you know we did everything right you know we 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 did they had the worldview education you know they had the classical Christian education we did the courtship thing you know we sang the right songs and it's just like it's like you haven't yet pointed me to a single thing that should give me any hope that you that you've or any indication you've you've raised your kids with any degree of wisdom because wisdom going back again to Bezalel is going with the grain of creation and so your job as a parent is to study and discern the nature of the children that God's given you and to go with the grain so so I tell this to, you know kids their favorite cop out um, is it's not fair you know you why you why you you punishing me this way and not the other kids this way and my response to my kids is because you're you and and I'm not going to it would be wicked for me to treat you the same way I treat my other kids right. because you're not my other kids you you are God's built you in a particular way you have particular temptations tem- particular weaknesses proclivities that I have to deal with differently than I do your other siblings right yeah and, and yeah. there's a there's this sense right. in Christianity that we're not we're not supposed to do that that's not fair yeah, yeah. um if you've got one kid that's an introvert and one kid that's an extrovert and, and you're, um, yeah, as a parent, you're going to ground your kids for disobedience. The introvert might think of grounding as a great, <laughs> as a great thing. Oh, I, I can't, right. you know, I'd like to sit home and hang out in my room anyway. Right. You know, right. and, and, and so for them, it's not even a punishment at all for the extrovert. It might be a terrible punishment to cut them off right. from, from right. friends. I'm not advocating grounding as a form of punishment to begin with, no. but I'm just saying your, right. your point is exactly right. When we, when, when we look for a substitute for wisdom, we tend to look for a one size fits all solution right. that does not grapple with the complexities and, and realities of the situation. Right. right. Well, we can, and the goal is not, the goal is not uniformity, right? We're not trying to put out a bunch of, of cookie cutter kids. We're, we're trying to, receive with gratitude from God the kids that he's given us and be faithful stewards of them and they and, and and successfully launching them out into the world is going to look different there's obviously going to be some things that we hope are going to you know, be true of all of them but but it should look very different if we're faithful stewards of these very different kids that God's given us to kind of wrap it up cuz I know we need to we need to we need to uh, to 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 end this here, um, I'll just say that I think um, one of the the best the best things about all of this that you that you said is that God's not a helicopter parent. That's what we learned from Ecclesiastes that that He is a God. Uh, in the example I gave earlier, He's the kind of God that lets us skin our knees. You know that that He actually is looking forward to the day when we're going to judge angels and is preparing us for that day by 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 not um, just uh, giving us a, um, a very, you know, play-by-play, step-by-step instruction for every day of our lives. He's actually giving us the opportunity to grow in wisdom. Um, and if we do it well, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a fun ride. Um, and we get to just enjoy, you know, the, the ride that we're on, that God's put us on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. That's really, really good. Appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on your podcast. Yeah. Well, this was a ton of fun. I hope we can do it again uh, soon. Uh, thanks for giving me so much of your time. Yeah. And uh, we we'll look forward to, uh, to talking to you again. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. All Liz. right. All thanks, right. Rich. Take care. We'll see you.